rubber is everywhere. Now, this may sound somewhat hyperbolic, but consider, for example, the soles of your shoes and your tires and the tires of airplanes are made of rubber. Many industrial processes, such as belts and, uh, well, all sorts of things use rubber as well. Considering these more industrial uses, it's clear that without a ready supply of rubber, a lot of conveniences that you may take for granted could well disappear. Now, rubber comes from two main sources, artificial rubber and the rubber tree. While artificial rubber is in some ways easier to create, it comes from oil, uh, and you don't have to grow a tree and tap that tree. Natural rubber is generally considered to be superior. To be more specific, natural rubber has superior mechanical strength and anti-aging properties. Indeed, according to the U.S. Tire Manufacturers Association, the average passenger car tire contains 19% natural and 24% synthetic rubber, further specifying that, synthetics, that the synthetic rubbers must be used in conjunction with natural rubber. And further, as the need for durability increases, such as with big rig trucks, the percentage of natural rubber goes up. Uh, specifically, going up to 34% natural and only 11% synthetic. Natural rubber's importance globally cannot be understated. But where does it come from? 97% of the world's rubber comes from Southeast Asia. But the rubber tree itself, Hevea brasiliensis, is native to the Amazon rainforest. Why is it then that Brazil is ranked 11th in rubber production across all countries, while Thailand, the globe away from South America, is ranked number one, producing five and a half billion dollars worth of rubber compared to Brazil's 240 million. That story starts in the year 1839, with the discovery of the vulcanization process. Vulcanization is a process in which natural latex, uh, specifically the extract from the rubber tree, is combined with sulfur and heat to create rubber as we know it today. This was what started interest in rubber as a material, as latex by itself isn't terribly useful, but rubber with its ability to bounce and stretch while not deforming too much is a fascinating material. And the demand only increased from that point, especially with the introduction of automobiles. It was used in bicycle tires before that, but automobiles were what skyrocketed demand. Due to a combination of local factors, the most important of which was native disease, uh, we'll touch back on that later, South America wasn't able to match the global demand for rubber, and in 1876 the British took rubber tree seeds back to England, about 70,000 of them. And about 22 of these seeds were then transplanted to their colonies in Southeast Asia, Malaysia especially, and are now the genetic foundation for pretty much every rubber tree in Southeast Asia. Of course, there were no such native threats to the rubber tree present in Southeast Asia, no diseases, and so the rubber tree was able to be grown wildly successfully, and this was what established the region's dominance in the rubber fields globally today. A critically important takeaway from this is that the majority of the world's rubber supply comes from the descendants of roughly 22 seeds. This has resulted in rubber trees in Southeast Asia being almost exclusively clones of one another. And this lack of genetic diversity is a big issue when it comes to disease resistance, as if one, one tree is vulnerable, the rest of them will be as well. As you're probably able to guess, this is a pretty big problem. And indeed, in South America, there exists a disease classified as a biological weapon by the United Nations. It is called South American Leaf Blight, or SALB for short, and it is near unstoppable. To date, all chemical attempts to stop it have failed, as well as all biological control methods such as selective breeding. SALB destroys the leaves of rubber trees, which kills the rubber tree almost without fail. There's occasionally resistance to SALB, but such cases are rare, and the vast majority of rubber trees will die when infected with SALB. 
As, up to this point, salt has not spread beyond the Amazon rainforest, but as the world grows more and more interconnected, especially with transcontinental aviation, the risk of salp spreading to Southeast Asia is only growing. And if it were to get there, the evidence suggests that we wouldn't be able to stop it. To illustrate the problem that disease can cause a monocultural plant, such as rubber, one simply has to look at the example of the banana tree. Specifically, we're going to take a look at Australia. The Northern Territory of Australia was once known as a very large banana growing region, but with the spread of Tropical Race 4, equivalent to bananas as salve is to rubber trees. Production went down from 7,000 tons in, two, in the year 2000 to about 2,000 tons in 2007. This was just due to the presence of one disease. Banana growers in the region reported that no matter what efforts they undertook, they were simply unable to stop it. One farmer attempted to grow in another region entirely, taking extreme measures to prevent the spread of the soil, but the trees were infected with Tropical Race 4 anyways. An entire industry was essentially destroyed. And it's easy to see something like this happening with the rubber industry as well. The rubber industry in Southeast Asia suffers from a massive lack of genetic diversity, which renders it horribly vulnerable to something like salb. And if salb were to spread, all measures taken in the past have been unable to stop it, and I don't see that changing. The best we can hope for, realistically, is that Saul doesn't isn't able to leave South America. Don't just take my word for how destructive Saul is, though. If take the word of the Brazilian government, which started a program called Probor in 1972, which ran until 1986, 150,000 hectares of plantation were planted of rubber plantation, and by 1986. A hundred thousand of those were devastated by Salb. In short, if Salb were to spread to Southeast Asia, we would face a global crisis of rubber. The world's ability to manufacture rubber without Southeast Asia, and based on the evidence, it seems that if Salb were to spread to Southeast Asia, rubber production would be decimated. It seems that the world might not be able to recover. Perhaps they would, given enough time, and perhaps enough reliance on artificial rubber, but in the short term, the world would face a crisis, and measures must be taken to prevent the spread of salt. <laughs>